Hi, everybody. However, how's everybody doing? Everybody having a great, great time? Yes, I'm having a great time. Oh, that's so great. We're at week five. Can you believe it? We're already at week five. God. Are you guys doing all your holiday shopping done? Getting ready to make plans? Anybody? Yeah. Everybody has plans. So, this week, we are talking about menus. I love this week because it's all about the service. You know, it's about the service of your establishment. So that's what we get to go into. And I absolutely love it. You will notice with the PowerPoint slides because I went a little nuts. Just a little bit, right, Chef? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. But I can boop, share. Ta-da! So, <clears throat> week five, we have a discussion this week. Yay! Yay, I'm so glad I got a discussion. Woo! Isn't that great? <laughs> Do you guys love discussions? Why are you guys not shaking your heads? <laughs> discussions are fun. I have two discussions I have to do tonight for my schooling. And you have, those are going to be due on Saturday with two peer responses due on Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time, as always. And then you have your good old assignment that will be due on Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Now, how were the, uh, how was the assignments looking this past week, Chef? Very, very good. I actually believe as of right now, I think I have them all graded, uh, just about. And uh, as far as how the assignment looked, I think most students took a very um, methodic approach. If you had to, so for this assignment, everyone had to identify what they thought was the most expensive item on the menu, and then look at food cost and labor cost and see how the food cost and labor cost impacted that particular menu item. And I had students looking at things, um, obviously looking at the most obvious, so the actual food cost, the, the cost to for all the ingredients, but there was uh, students that were looking at the cross utilization. So if they saw that you know duck skin was only used in one item or duck fat, duck fat wasn't used in anything else, that that is going to affect the food cost. So there was some really, um, really chef thinking going on with these answers that I saw this week. And it just, it made me so proud to see some of these answers. And the same thing with labor. Some of you were looking at things as, you know, this forward thinking, like uh, if something is smoked, that it's being brined and or cured and then the, maybe somebody having to stay late to be able to uh, smoke those items and then take them out and then the time that it's going to take to maybe cool them to be able to prepare those items for later so there was um, lots and lots of really good thinking with this particular assignment so I think for the most part these these were really good uh, and if somebody missed a little bit on it maybe some points here or there they were on the right path they just didn't take it you know, the, that next step further. They say, well, um, the ingredients are expensive. Well, which ingredients are expensive? And that's kind of what <laughs> the assignment was looking for. But I think for the most part, these were super, super good. Nice. Well, that's fantastic. So, and then this week, we are talking about picking out stuff for your menu. Um, what are things that you guys think you have to worry about when you are serving your items on your menu? So, um, plating. Temperature. What is temperature, yep. Plating. Plating, yes. Presentation is key. All the, all the plates come out to the table at the same time. All the plates come out to the table at the same time? Yeah. Oh, I saw whole time. Yeah. What else do you worry about when you're feeding your people? It's what they ordered. What they ordered? What Product else? Delivery. Product delivery. 
<clears throat> now, are you going to expect something different from McDonald's versus the French Laundry? What are you going to expect from McDonald's? Bad food. Um, fast food, basically. Um, I, guess, yeah. I saw a cheap burger. Yep. So, what do you expect from the French Laundry? More fine dining scale. Fine dining. High class dining. Um, the product being displayed beautifully. Yep, the product being displayed beautifully. And then because it's about the experience, right? What type of experience are you getting? What is the, I'm going to mute everyone. Can I mute? What is the type of experience you are giving to your customers? Because price, you know, people are looking for a value, right? But that value is going to defer, like change because of the customer's expectations. If I'm going to McDonald's, I'm going to expect to get a deal because it's a value, right? You're getting um, a burger for 99 cents or for $2. But if I'm going to uh, the French Laundry, or if I'm going to go somewhere really nice, I'm going to expect that high level of service to match the food, correct? Yay, I see shaking heads, yeah. <laughs> so you want to make certain if you have your concept, you talk, you know your concept, We've gone over your type of demographic, who you're gonna be targeting for your market, right? And now you need to make certain everything is going to match. You need the front of the house to match uh, what the back of the house is creating and how you're going to deliver that experience. What do you guys think of when you hear Disney? Mid, uh, Disney World, Mickey Mouse, United Kingdom, classy food. That's my favorite place, y'all. That's my favorite place. Disney, kids, what else do you guys think? What are they trying to do? What's their experience? Childlike, fantasy. Fantasy, yep. Yeah. Because it, it's making magic, right? It's magical. That's what they're trying to portray. They are be, making magic happen. So that is that experience. So when you walk into a theme park, that's why everybody's always in character, right? Nobody ever breaks character because they're making certain that that magic is there and it's consistent and it's what the customer expects. So that's going to be the same in your case when whether you are going to be a food truck and you're going to have counter service versus a fine dining high-end restaurant. So let us talk about some of the funness of this awesome slide I made for you guys. Yay! Super excited about the slide. So back of the house, the classic brigade. Who made that delightful classic brigade that all of us use today? Scofia. Yes, you should all know it because you have it on your, your logo, right? Escoffier made this great, delightful back of the house classic brigade for us to follow. And I love it because I would rather want to say, like, instead of saying a fry cook, I'm totally writing on my resume that I was the friteur. Uh, that sounds so much last year, doesn't it? It sounds so much better. So, or the rotisserie, I love it. Oh, I'm going to say that. I'm not going to say I roasted stuff. I'm going to say I was the rotisserie. Um, or, and then you have garmage. I love garmage. That's like one of my favorite classes. Um, making all the fragois and the pâtés, putting it through your chinois, getting it that flavor nice. Oh, love that stuff. But <clears throat> This is all the 
things you can have the stations you can have at the back of the house. Now, how actual, how many you end up having is kind of up to you and your establishment. How uh, high-end fine dining are you going to have? And how many of these style stations are you going to have? Because some things are going to be dependent on it. Are you going to make everything in-house? Are you going to have stuff pre-made? Because sometimes pre-made is okay to do versus other times. And you need to know when to decide what you're going to do in-house versus what you're going to buy pre-made. Like ketchup is a, I love ketchup. Ketchup is great. Ketchup takes, my recipe takes about, what is it, like four hours to make. Um, but and Chef Suzanne is laughing at me. But yes, I have made my own ketchup. I've made my own. Um, I have also made ketchup. I, it's, I guess it's fun. <laughs> oh, I, give me some, I, I actually prefer Hunt's to Heinz. So I don't know. There's a, there's a debate for another day. <laughs> I know. I love ketchup because, I mean, I originally started in um, the Orient with it actually not even having tomatoes in it. It didn't even get tomatoes in it until like 18, it was like 1860 or 1870. It actually became like had tomatoes put in it, but it was actually like vinegar and fish. That was the original ketchup was vinegar, like uh, vinegar and fish together. And then they, so if you go to Britain in the UK, because they brought it up, you can actually see that some of their ketchup still has like anchovies in it. Fun little fact for you guys. But um, are you going to make your own ketchup and spend those four hours? Or are you just going to go buy Heinz ketchup in a bottle and just call it good? So those are the things that you can think about. Same thing like with anybody with bakeries and stuff some stuff you make ahead right um a lot of bakeries that i have been to i did not do this at my bnb &B, but i know plenty of other bakeries that do this they bake their cakes ahead of time and then they put it in the freezer i was never one that did that because i did not like that but that's a typical thing that happens they make it ahead of time and then they stick it in the freezer and then they pull it out when it's time for the wedding, time to, you know, frost everything, make it look pretty, all that good stuff. So you have to decide, like, when you're looking at your menu and the style, the style of service you're going to provide, are you going to do pre-made versus are you going to actually make, what are you going to make in-house? Uh, because sometimes you can make your own mayonnaise, but is it really going to be worth it? Or are you just going to buy the mayonnaise? And good old Heinz or best value is a best value. I think that's the one. I'm all about Heinz or best value. My mom's a Miracle Whip girl, and I'm like, no, hi. <laughs> so, or best made or whatever one that one is. So, those are things you have to consider when you're looking at if you're going to do pre made versus, um, pre made versus. Uh, making it in-house and then how many stations are you really going to have in the back of the house and then you have your delightful front of the house here you got your someone yay you got your dining room manager your head waiter your captain your wait staff all these people and once again how much of a service you're going to provide is really going to depend on how many of these positions you're actually going to have. You're gonna have an ultra fine dining establishment. You're gonna make certain that you have a sommelier there. May, that is there and they're going to be in charge of your wines and make sure that everything is pairing nicely together. Um, <clears throat> and then you got all the fun awesomeness of your place settings. So when you guys go out, you normally probably see a casual place setting, right? Your casual place setting is going to look something like this, right? How many people go out and they see this style? You got your napkin, you got your water glass, your salad fork, your dinner fork, all that good stuff right here. 
Now you may be wondering like, why do you need to know this stuff? There have been plenty of times when I have been out in the catering world and I had to put all of the place settings down for 150 guests and I had to make certain I knew exactly what type of place setting we were going for. Cause I was like, oh, what is this? What are we doing at this delightful wedding? Are we doing casual? Is this a buffet style? Is this, um, are we doing Russian style service? What are we doing to make sure that I put down enough utensils and plates and glasses for every single place? So how many people usually see casual setting, right? Raise of hands. Yep, seeing a raise of hands, yep. And then we have the delightful formal place settings. You're gonna see these at a more of an upscale dining establishment because you have all of this fun, you have linen tablecloths, right? You have this great, you got your own place card, you got your bread plates, it's nice and fancy looking. Doesn't that look nice? Super nice and pretty. Now, how many people have used this style before? Anybody? I did. I do this every single day. Every single day at the B&B, this is what I did. Right here. Right? Right here. Every single time somebody would come down for breakfast, that is what they got. So, when you're looking at that style, what type of food are you expecting? Upscale. What did you say, Ronald? Upscale. Upscale. Ashley, what were you going to say? Fancy. Just so, yeah. Fancy. So what's a good example of fancy food? What do you, what do you want? If you see that much silverware, what are you expecting to eat? If it's breakfast, maybe a croissant with a grape juice and an um, egg within a little, um, I don't forgot what kind of egg it's called, uh, where you crack it in half and... Um, oh, the like soft boiled? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Something like that. Uh, and um, <clears throat> that's the starter. Then you come down with the other, maybe like a crepe or something such as that, just different, uh, different, um, what is it called? You said crepes. That's good. Yeah, but I was trying to figure out different levels. Like when you start off with the appetizer, then a little bit, it, it, it's like a four course meal or a seven course, you know, meal. Oh. Yep. Different courses. Yeah, you're going to expect different courses, right? Gabriel, you look like you were going to say something. That, that's what I was saying is you're going to, you would expect to go through several courses when you look at a place setting like that. Yeah. yeah. So then what would you, uh, what type of ingredients do you expect to see at a place like this? Uh, I would expect to see uh, probably more from scratch, like, you know, um, uh, you know, like she said, crepes, and then, you know, move into your, your fruit, uh, probably have like a fruit dish and a salad, maybe a soup, tea. Um, I don't know. I've, I've never eaten at a bed and breakfast before, so I don't, you know, I, I don't know what would that would entail. A lot of fresh ingredients, huh? Right now made ingredients. Yeah, a lot of fresh ingredients because there's a lot of stuff going on in here, right? Look at all of this stuff. You got your salad plate, you got your service plate. And one thing I really want to bring to attention to you guys too, um, because I did not know this until I went to, I started catering. Um, was you see your forks here, you know, it's always outside in, right? So you're, so you're always, whatever course is going to start first, that's going to be on your outside. So that's why your salad fork is on the outside because that's your, that's the like one you're going to eat. But then you notice your fork, it kind of goes in that circle. So whenever you do this, you make certain the cake fork, you're just continuing that line. And then it's the same thing with your dessert spoon. The spoons are pointing up and then it's going the other way. You're just continuing the line. So you're trying to make it like it's a circle going around. So if you ever wonder what way you're supposed to have your de dessert spoon and your cake fork, 
just remember, just continue the circle. Make it like a, make it going around. It wants to go hang out. It's like a little driving, right? If you're driving a car, it's driving on that side of the road. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I would expect what type of salad? What am I gonna expect in here? Look how nice and pretty that is. What kind of salad am I looking for? What type of salad do you feed me on that plate? Maybe a wedge salad? A wedge salad? Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Organic greens. Organic greens, right? Very nice description. Look at that. Nice descriptive words there. With heirloom veggies, tomatoes, um, you know, nice fresh veggies. Yeah. Nice. Yes, you can do the heirloom veggies. Look at that. Look at all those nice, delightful words you guys are using. That's like the kind of words you put on your menu, right? Organic, heirloom, right? That's fantastic. Now, there's the ultra formal. How many people seen Pretty Woman? People? Pretty Woman? Remember her with the snail? Slippery little suckers? That's what you got right here. There is ultra formal, formal dining right here. You have all of these nice, delightful, you got your menu card, you got a billion glasses for wine. <laughs> You're like, why is there so many glasses for wine? Is anybody gonna actually be able to stand up after dinner if they drink that many glasses? And then you have your fish fork, your dinner forks, your salad forks, like you have all of this stuff right here. And that is what it looks like. <clears throat> so when you see this, how many people have watched like Downton Abbey or at least know Downton Abbey? You don't have to have watched it, but you've seen, you know, the commercials for PBS and you heard about people going crazy about it. Nobody, Downton Abbey? It's the old school, very like posh, you know? I've seen it. It's very proper. I mean, even your little bread, your little butter knife has its own proper little spot right there, right? So what type of food are you going to serve me on like on that table? The best. The best? Yeah, I expect it to be the best. If I have that much stuff in front of me, I'd be like, I better, I'm expecting to be wowed, right? So what would you expect? Delicate, dainty. Delicate. Quality. Quality. Am I going to see a lot of pre-made stuff on this? No. No? We um, into, say, a wine dinner with uh, six courses, five to six courses, um, you know, everything made fresh, small portions, um, like said, many wine glasses, so different, you know. I see exotic. Of meat, exclusively uh, things, it's like nobody gets caviar, exclusive stuff. Yeah, you're going to expect a high level, right? I'm also going to expect a high level of service to go with this. If I'm expecting to see this much stuff, I better expect to see a high level of service from my wait staff to go with it. And I do not want, if I am looking at this right here, I'm not expecting a burger from McDonald's, right? not expecting this smash down thing. I'm expecting a beautiful presentation, maybe some like immersion foam or a beef Wellington style something, you know. I'm gonna expect to be wowed and dazzled if I have this much stuff here. And so these are things you need to consider when you're looking at your menu, Hello. when you're looking at your concepts. Hello? Who is that? Oh. Okay. And then I wanted to go into some of the other ones, like a Chinese hot pot. So a Chinese table setting. How many people have ever seen this type of setting before? Anybody? So Chinese food is actually quite healthy if you don't order the sesame chicken and all of the fried stuff that you typically see. It's actually quite healthy. 
Um, so this is what I actually typically see is you have this hot pot. Um, and the Chinese hot pot is like fondue, but without cheese. So they have different type of broths and you make all of the food. This is how they present all the food. And then the people put the food in and they cook it at the table. So it's like fondue, but without any cheese. It's all like different broth. So this one right here, I can tell is spicier than this one. This one's gonna be like a more mild one versus a spicy one. And how they have their restaurants set up is you can even see the little hot pot is right within the table itself. So, and then you just get all of these extras that you just put into the, all the vegetables, you throw it all into the broth, you let it simmer. And then when you think it's done, you pull it out and then you eat it. Um, doesn't it look great? Are you guys excited? You guys get I think we have a place like they call a melting pot that does the same thing. <laughs> yep, melting pot. Yep, they do a lot of the like fondue, like a lot of cheese stuff. Um, but this one is very much like, um, it's very healthy. Chinese food can be very, very healthy just as long as you don't get all of the deep fried, like, you know, the Americanized version is very deep fried, but, um, but in reality, they're, they're quite healthy. And then we have the Japanese table setting. Because no matter the style, you need to make certain you understand the type of setting that your customers are going to expect. So people are going to go into an Asian restaurant. They're going to, especially in America, they're going to expect chopsticks. But they're also going to expect you to offer utensils, right? For those who don't quite no are not proficient with using utensils i mean the chopsticks they have utensils as a backup um but this is a very typical japanese style setting um and then we have the different styles of service we have the american one which you're sitting down it's plated the food comes to you right and then we have the buffet style the original name was smorgasbord, right? And your buffet style is the one that, you know, uh, we have this actually quite a bit in, uh, out here for weddings. I see a lot more buffets out here in Colorado for weddings. Um, how about you, Chef Suzanne? Have you seen more buffets around in Texas or? Oh, oh, oh yes. Definitely lots of uh, buffets for uh, big events. And the, I think the cool thing about a buffet is there's so many different varieties. It can be very basic. So you've got your barbecue and, you know, then you've got the big elaborate uh, meals with carving stations and all that kind of stuff. So, oh, absolutely. Uh, don't see as much. I know you've got down here next the butler service and we don't see that a whole lot around here, but that's just because of where I think I'm probably more because of where I'm located. <laughs> yeah. Um, how many people have actually heard of the Butler service before? Okay, Gabriel, did you guys ever experience it? No, no. You guys, you've seen it? You've seen it on Downton Abbey? Any Downton Abbey watchers? Oh, not that many. But it's that whole you know, the server comes with this beautiful platter of food and then you are serving the guest individual portions right then and there from the platter. Um, I've done that like twice for a wedding, for two weddings, I've done it that way. Um, and both weddings, uh, the like one side was European. So they wanted that like style of service. So uh, it is something that you can see, um, but the American style buffet, you usually see that a lot around here. I'm sure all of you have gone to a buffet, right? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, um, yes. question, quick question. Yes. The butler service is that also, I think it's referred to as French service. No, French service is slightly different. And I have that on the next side, slide, Ronald. Okay. You getting ahead. Boom, boom. Because, oh wait, no, that's not at the next one, but it'll be coming up. Uh, I can just, let me go here. 
French service. It has the table side, but they're actually making it in front of you. So think of like crepes and like bananas fosters, or if you get that like Caesar salad that they're like preparing the Caesar salad in front of you. Um, that's more of that French style service because they're actually like, you know, making it in front of you. And a lot of people do that, like bananas fosters, because you got the, like the flambe going and it makes the beautiful flame and everybody goes, Oh my God, look at that. Woo. You know, get everybody going. Woo. So that's why banana fosters is a big one that you typically see. Uh, Amy, how can I help? Yeah, I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, what about like, uh, we have a place down here called Hakuto. It's like Japanese food where they make it right in front of you. That would be French service. It's like a hot grill right in front of you and they're cooking it and they're throwing it in the air and all of that. Oh yeah, like the hibachi grill style. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be considered more of that like French service because they're making it in front of you. Um, okay. Even though that's not, you know, they're not French at all, but <laughs> that is that style of service but then you see here we have English service uh which is a lot of you know that home style cooking the platters are brought out the host inspects it and then um and then you have your Russian style which is very similar to that butler but instead of the server giving you the, like, giving you the food, the person at the table will actually take the utensils and uh, scoop out the amount of food that they want, they're serving. Um, so that's the main difference between the, um, the, the two, is that it's, you know, did I just get those two mixed up? Did I just get those two mixed up? Chef? No, I think I did it. No, no okay. I think so. No, I think you got it right. Mother, I was like, wait, did I just mix this up? <laughs> no, you got it right. <laughs> yeah, I got it right. Never mind. Um, so, you know, it, and then you have the French service, and then we can go back to the counter service. So if you're at your food truck, you're going to get that counter service, right? It's going to be fast food, but, you know, uh, Subway and Chipotle, they're going to make it in front of you too, right? So they're making it all right in front of you. So it's uh, so you can see what they're putting into it. Um, so it's also fast food, you know, Subway, Chipotle, McDonald's, your food trucks. And then you have your cafe uh, cafeteria service where you just go up. It's more of that buffet style and you pick out what you want and then go to the register and then you sit down and eat it, right? Um, and then, because for each one of these, you're going to expect a high, a higher end. So say we have this French service right here, since we talked about that, Ronald. Um, for a French service, what type of place setting do you think would be appropriate? Would you guys do casual? Would you do the formal? Would you do the high end? What would you guys end up doing? Would you do ultra formal? It would be formal. You do formal? What about uh, casual? Do you think you would find somebody doing French style with a casual place? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> Paul says no. Oh, wait, Paul, you mu muted yourself. You, uh, why would you go through the place setting of the formal? <laughs> Uh, setting but have casual food that doesn't match to me no I mean for uh, the French style would you do would you see somebody making bananas fosters with a casual place setting no 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 I wouldn't think so then what about uh, the Russian service the Russian service where people are going around. Are you gonna expect to see a casual place setting? Or are you gonna expect to see that formal or the ultra formal? Formal. Ultra formal. Ultra formal, yep. Because you're expecting that high level of service, right? And then what about for your, uh, the American style? service the american service what do you guys think you would see formal formal would you see casual, casual. casual. right 
So then what type of food would you serve for a casual? Um, I mean, and for, for casual, you can go from regular steak to, you know, just, it depends on- What about Ruby Tuesdays? Ruby Tuesdays? Uh, uh, hold on a sec. What about, what were you gonna say, Ronald? You can finish up. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Now, uh, Chef Suzanne had her birthday yesterday. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Woo! Chef Suzanne! So, Chef Suzanne, fun. what did you have for your birthday dinner? Uh, I had uh, beef tenderloin topped with a love crab cake with a lemon, lemon crab butter sauce with mashed potatoes. No veggies for me yesterday. <laughs> oh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, I just realized. I muted myself to cough so nobody could hear me cough. <laughs> um, so then what type of service was it? Um, I would have to say it was very casual service. And uh, I think in this particular example, we didn't really even have a place setting. Our silverware was rolled. So uh, I kind of wish it had been a little fancier, but that just happens to be where we went. Um, but the food, I think, deserved more from the setting than we got. And uh, so that's actually important too, with all, this, all of these things Chef has been talking about. Your service needs to match your style of food. Everything really needs to fit together. Uh, so you're not getting this amazing meal with the wrong settings, you know, because it kind of goes both directions. You also don't want chicken tenders and mac and cheese with the ultra, you know, setting, you know, the ultra fine setting there. So it, it's, it all has to go together. And Chef has done such a nice job with all of this. Are you sharing your PowerPoints with them for this one, Chef? Uh, yeah, yes, I am, yes. Yeah, because I think there's so much good information that, uh, really tells you all how important it is that these things all are cohesive and match really well together. Because I don't think my meal, um, I don't think everything that we got did justice to the meal that we had last night. And I still enjoyed it again today because I'm a leftover girl. <laughs> well, yeah, I was very surprised because when Chef Suzanne told me what she had, I was like, oh my God, that's so fancy. I'm like, where did you go? And then, and then you said. Longhorn. Longhorn Steakhouse. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, oh, I was like, but they didn't, like, they had such a great menu item, but it didn't match the style. Like, you expect, when you hear those items, you expect it to be really, like, a higher end, and they didn't give you that higher end. So that's where it's really important to make certain that you're matching everything, and no matter... Uh, because you want to make certain you're matching the expectations. Because what were the two things that make the product for our industry? You guys remember what the two things were? Tangibles and intangibles. Would you say that again, James? The tangible um, and the intangibles. Yes, the tangibles and the intangibles. Yay! Yes, because the tangibles are the food, the food, the plates, the silverware, all that, the like, all of that, the linens, the napkins, the uh, lighting, um, and then the intangible is the ambiance. The ambiance, your experience, right? So you're trying to make certain that you're, those are the two things that combine to make your product. So you need to make certain that they are combining correctly and they are matching what, um, so that you don't end up with a McDonald's burger at an ultra fine dining establishment. Now, Brian, I saw that you had your hand up first, and then, Gabrielle, you can go after that. Sure. So I understand trying to match up the experience with the food, with the service, and certainly at an ultra or even a 
really fine dining establishment, you don't want to, you know, create the an experience that's not up to that level. But at the same time, I think that a lot of restaurants are trying to appeal to the masses. I mean, we talked about the the the, the Russian type service, you know, and I would consider, you know, something like a Brazilian steakhouse to be that type of service. And I've been to several Brazilian steakhouses that are a little more casual because they're trying to pull in a lot more people, you know, I mean, because, you know, probably because that's just more to their, uh, you know, bottom line. That's all. And yeah, that's a very excellent point, Brian. And you have to remember that these are just, these are your guidelines. And these are the things that you need to consider when you are looking at your establishment. And you need to, you know, it's like, it's like when you're figuring out a recipe for the first time. You're, I always look at, um, if I'm gonna make something for the very first time, I'm picking out five different recipes and I'm looking over to see the similarities so I can see if I'm actually like, what's the same, what's different. And I'm picking and choosing what I liked and what I didn't like. And then I'm creating my own recipe that way, right? So it's kind of that similar thing with your, with like the Brazilian. Yes, Suzanne. Uh, well, what I was thinking also, um, when Brian was just talking about that too, and sometimes you have to look at other things besides that actual restaurant. You may have to look at their competition uh, and their target market. So we talked a, a lot about that, those sort of things already in this class, and that all ties together with what you were saying, Brian, uh, that... A, a restaurant has to look at all of those things uh, because they want to reach everyone or try and reach as many people as possible. But like we said, sometimes it's not possible. And that's why sometimes businesses try to appeal to too many people. You know, uh, you know, we want to try and bring in as much business as possible, but sometimes you kind of muddy the waters and it can get really confusing for your guests. Uh, so you do want to bring in a lot of customers, but you want to make sure that you really have that cohesive concept. Uh, where all these things tie together, your service and your food style and all of that. Um, and if they don't, that, that's you know, kind of what can cause issues sometimes and, and businesses fail because they don't, aren't, that, aren't cohesive and just have too many ideas and aren't defined with who they are and what they're trying to portray. I hope that makes sense. It does. And it's kind of like my recipe example because I'm looking at multiple recipes. I'm looking at my competition seeing what they did, seeing what I liked, what I didn't like, and then I'm creating my own recipe. So I'm creating my own establishment, but I'm benchmarking, which means I'm looking at the best in class. I'm looking at all the different as other establishments and competition to see what they're doing. And then I'm going to decide on what's going to be the best fit for my target market, for what my needs are. Uh, Gabrielle, go. Your turn. And then Lisa. Yeah, um, I'm kind of leaning the same way towards Brian and um, and the other chef because, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm having all kinds of mixed emotions because I totally understand where you guys are coming from. And then I totally understand where we're coming from. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, there's all these different styles of service. Um, and which one do you want, which one would you want for your restaurant? And, uh, you know, like me, I'm more of a, maybe like an American style hibachi where I'd like to just, you know, I don't know, whatever you want, I'll make it right here in front of you. You know what I mean? And then, you know, like how he said, you know, I've been to all kinds of different places where you have, you know, like the Brazilian style where they're like shaving the meat right off the skewer right there at your table. Um, and I can totally see where restaurants, you know, you know, you got a great chef and you've got 50 million ideas and they're trying to do it all at one place. And, and then how that can fail too, because you're trying to do so much, um, so much stuff and you can't um, capitalize and on, on exactly what you're trying to do. But my point I wanted to make was, um, you know, one of the things that is kind of going out of, out of style, I don't know if it'll ever come back, is more of, you know, like how you are showing the place settings for the, the, the extra special. 
um, you know, that's kind of a little bit more country club, which those are kind of being phased out across the board. Um, they are. It is very hard to find. And I notice, I especially notice that um, if I do it, it's mostly for weddings. Right. That I'm doing this for. So and, if I'm catering, I notice I'm doing it a lot more for caterings than I am for anything else. So, but it is still a good thing to know it that is. way you understand, like you have all the information and you have all the resources and then you get to decide what's going to be best for your establishment, for your place, what's going to work best for you. Correct. And it's all you do if you're, if you are catering, then to let your customers know that you can provide that service or you can provide uh, just barbecue. Exactly. <laughs> You can, you know, Barbecue. Yeah, you want the yeah, you want the cookout special, or do you want the the fine dine with the caviar and everything that goes with that? I have done weddings before, where just the wedding party itself had the exquisite fine dine, everything, and then all of the guests did the buffet. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. You you know where you can kind of, and then that's what's, uh, you know what's cool about knowing these different styles because. Uh, you know, you can offer them, you know, and, and sky's the limit, I guess. Um, but, you know, uh, one other point I really wanted to make too is, uh, you know, I eat out all the time and I keep finding that like chefs are, you know, maybe getting away from, um, you know, they all want to do their own thing. They'll do something like a menu with, you know, seven to 10 items and every, item on that menu is you know unbelievably good but all you have at your table is a fork spoon and knife so you know like some of the things like the flavor and the taste of what they're providing you know speaks for itself you know i've been to you know like little places that are like speakeasy and it's the best meal i've ever had you know and it's just like you know mind-blowing what the chefs can do you know and, and they just keep it you know simple too. And and that's very important. But you also have to remember too. I'm showing you this stuff, but you know, like as Chef Suzanne said, she would have wanted more. But you know, are you gonna get that same like cuisine with, you know, you're not gonna serve plastic forks and knives for that high end. So. It's even as simple as like the style of like plates you get and service, like service wear that you are providing to the customers is gonna like, you know, make that difference. Are you gonna do plastic cups? Or are you gonna do glasses, like real glasses? Those are things you need to cons like that you think about when you're looking at the style of service and how high end or not you're gonna go and then lisa i do see your hand is up but i did want to get to this real quick um which is the dim sum service for those who have never had dim sum before it's fantastic i absolutely love it we go every sunday at 10 30 um and they have everything on the cart they wheel it to your table they say what do you want and you're like i want that 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 and then they stamp your card and then they go on their way. Um, it's it's a the dim sum is the like you know all the Chinese dumplings and the pot stickers like all that type of stuff is that dim style service. Um, and then because I'm more aware of it due to my husband being Asian, um, but there is very much chopstick etiquette. And oftentimes I'm putting this stuff up here because there's so many times when you put something and anything can eat like pretty much mean death. So you don't want it to mean death when you're doing chopsticks. And I've seen it a lot of times at like, especially tasting menus where they're like, oh, I'm going to do this Asian twist. And then they like present it and how they present the food is with the chopsticks, like sticking down and coming to the thing and it's like oh that's cool you're like feeding the dead that is what that means is like you're actually feeding the dead if you like cross them and it's sticking out of the plate so 
and some people will be offended. So you need to just make certain that if you're using something from a different culture, um, that you understand the meanings behind it so that you don't offend anybody and you don't offend their cultures because chopsticks, a lot of stuff is, um, yes, Suzanne, like Chinese tapas. That is a chef Suzanne. Yeah, that is a fantastic uh, explanation for it. I, I love that. It's a nice, short, sweet explanation of what dim sum is kind of like. Yeah, that is like perfect. And so you just need to make certain that you understand um, the etiquette for this type of stuff, because I definitely have gone to a few tastings where I've helped out my friend and I'm like, Oh, what are you doing? That's like for a funeral. Like that's what you do in a funeral in Korea, but you don't do it like for serving food because that's going to offend your crowd right now. Like, so knowing your the culture of the food that you're like, actually like preparing for people is important um and then we have our delightful assignment and remember discussion is due on saturday two peer responses on tuesday your assignment will be due on tuesday but i have a surprise for you guys if you get your assignment in by sunday you will get extra credit Fancy, fancy extra credit. So get your assignment in by Sunday and you get extra credit. Uh, I see Chef Suzanne, I'm gonna give it to you. And then Lisa and James, we will do your questions after Chef does uh, talks about the assignment. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. I know okay. it's not the most exciting stuff, but we'll go ahead and talk about the assignment. All right, I'm gonna share my screen, I think. I don't know why I have such a hard time doing this. All right, let's see if. All right, does everyone see the class page? Cool. All right, so here is where your assignment is. And I will click on this to kind of show you what you're doing this week. And I'll click through all the parts of it here in just a second. But basically, two of the menus that you had to choose from for this week, you'll see again. This time you're going to take both of those menus and you're going to answer some questions and I'll show you that next. Maybe. Well, there's the menus. There's one and there's the other one, but let me pull up the actual assignment. All right. Everybody see that? All right. So both of the restaurants, Cafe Luke and Le Pichon and La Vache, uh, are wanting to add burgers to their menu. And for each restaurant, Cafe Luke and Le Cochon, you need to explain what type of burger that restaurant would be using. All right, so if you remember, I'll jump over here to one of these menus real quick. All right, so here is Cafe Luke. So based on the information that you see on this menu, what type of burger do you think would be on this menu? All right, so again, uh, what ingredients would a burger at this restaurant have? So I want you to um, tell me about that burger. What is going to be on it? What's going to be in it? Um, maybe the name of it. You can kind of write it as if it were on the menu. So kind of make it look like some of the other items from that menu. How would it be plated? How would you present that particular menu item to guests if you were the owner of Cafe Luke? And how much would that burger cost and why? So you're gonna to have to look at the other items on the menu and kind of come up with a burger you would like to add, how it would be presented, and how much it would cost and why you've chosen that price. And then you get to do it again for the second restaurant, uh, Lake Cachon. So you're gonna do that for both of those restaurants. It, I think it looks a whole lot scarier than it actually is, kind of like last week's assignment looked really intense. Uh, but you're basically gonna look at these menus and you're gonna be the chef and okay, this is what I think a burger would look like at this restaurant. Tell us about the burger. Tell us how you would present it at that restaurant. Tell us how much you would sell it for and why you've chosen that price. We good? What do we think? Does that sound super scary? Or are we thinking that sounds pretty cool? We good? Sounds awesome to me. I'm excited. I think, no, I think this one's kind of fun. Um, being a little bit of creativity. So you're looking at that menu and, you know, just 
pretend like that you wrote that Cafe Luke menu. What burger would you add? It's, it's missing a burger. You got to add a burger. What would you add? How would you plate it? And how much would you sell it for? So you get to use a little bit of creativity, you know, have some fun with it. Look at some of the other ingredients on the menu. We did talk about cross utilization. So think about it, you know, you're, you're the chef, put your chef hat on, you know, put your chef brain back on and you're like, okay, I see that this restaurant is, you know, using a apple chutney. So maybe I need to, you know, add a turkey burger with apple chutney and whatever else. Have fun with this. This is a really cool assignment. Yeah. yeah, and um, <laughs> I know, yeah, it's going to be great. I love that you brought up chutney. Nobody likes making chutney, but as soon as they see it on the menu, they're like, oh, my God, it's like, so funny. <laughs> you know? It's so funny because chutney is so easy to make, too, but, like, nobody likes making it um, for some reason at home. Uh, and also remember, yeah, like, the discussions due on Saturday, your assignment due on Tuesday, extra credit is on Sun. If you turn it in by Sunday, you get extra credit. And you also get extra credit for doing that survey. So please do the survey because you will also get extra credit. And when you do the survey, remember, if you say that I'm horrible, you can't just say that I'm horrible. You have to say why I'm horrible. That's the key. If you learned anything from all the assignments, you got to put that why. You got to explain there. why. You have to explain why. Exactly. Because I will not be able to learn if I don't know why. So put that Y in there. Now, Lisa, what was your question? More of a, a, a well, it's not really a question, it's a comment about <laughs> etiquette and how it's not taught in schools now and it's not like something that you learn formally like you would, like when I was younger, I went to a private school and that was one of the items on the curriculum that you learn etiquette and how to set a table and things like that. I know they don't teach that in the school systems anymore, but I know up in New England, when I went to a parochial school, that was on uh, every grade, you learn how to set a table and along with home economics and things like that, which they no longer have. I was just, you know, have you noticed that in the restaurants? Now, well, it and it's interesting too, I actually just, uh, we did a catering and it was an etiquette lunch. So this, they actually have businesses where like people will go around and they, we had to create a, like we did a whole five course. And it's interesting too, because we did a French Asian infused meal. And so like I made like pots de creme and I did like a five spice Chantilly cream. And for those for Chantilly cream. That Chantilly cream, you can put on that menu for your high end, you know, fine dining establishment and charge a buck 25 more, even though it's just whipped cream, right? Chantilly cream, whipped cream, the same thing. But if you call it Chantilly cream, you can charge a buck 25 more. Um, <laughs> and it sounds for dear. But, um, and I did, like, yeah, that Asian five spice Chantilly cream. And she actually walked through the process and she took about half an hour for every single course. And she explained like, I made a Parmesan bowls for all the salads. How do you break out the salad and break the bowls and all that kind of stuff and how, how people are supposed to eat the food. So there are still companies that go around and do this type of thing, but it is definitely like if, if you, they're not teaching it at school, you're learning it at home or at work, if you're working at an establishment. It's a lost uh, oh, And James, what was your question? Hi guys, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome, awesome. So just two things. One, I had a question like going back to, um, you know, offending different cultures. Um, where I work at right now, they, they stab their burgers. Um, to hold them in place, you know, and to also be able to just cut your burger in half. Uh, but where I live has a really high demographic of uh, Navajos. And um, every single day, every shift that I work, you know, burgers keep getting sent back to the kitchen, back to the kitchen, back to the kitchen, because it's offensive and they don't want to come back because um, it's not really because we're meaning to offend them, it's because of the ignorance of the culture where they live. So we reached out to like IT and upper management and they just for like maybe a no stab button on the computer or something like that. And we were told no. 
with no reason, is there any kind of like feedback you might have that why they would say no to something like that? Because they want to lose business. <laughs> it, it just sounds like just they, they just don't really understand how offensive it, it may be. And yeah. maybe there's maybe there's a community person that can explain it better to to the management. I don't know. Yeah, and maybe just, it needs to be like explained more. Like it needs more of a the communication where it's not just like, hey, we shouldn't do this because it's offensive. It's like, once again, you have to explain, well, why is it offensive? Maybe they don't understand why. So you have to explain it to them. And, and you know, in some places it's just, you know, like you can try to do what you can, but if, you know, like, if, especially if you're, is, is that like a corporate, I'm guessing it's more like corporate headquarters style thing, then it's, you know, you have so many things you can do. Um, but, you know, it could be that it just needs to be communicated better, or I, I wouldn't know why they would say no, because I would instantaneously be like, I'm offending my target market and my, like the demographic in my area. Yeah, I'm going to change what I am doing. <laughs> making certain. I, I, I did explain it to my director of operations in detail, you know, and I was like, they feel like the animal gave their life for you to have life. And then you stabbing it is insulting the animal, basically, mm -hmm. you know, um, but no feedback given. So I don't, I don't know, you know, is, and I know it's because we're corporate, but I just don't know. I, I wish I knew the whys behind it, you know, um, but because it is important, you know. I would even say, like, write it down. Don't just, like, say it, but reiterate it in, like, an email okay. that goes out. And then what was your other question? It wasn't really a question. Oh, okay. I to face-to-face -face say thank you to you and Chef Suzanne for all your feedback, your help everything that you guys have given me in the past couple of days um, because you guys are really helpful. And I really encourage everybody um, to reach out to all your chef instructors because I'm really learning even outside of course material because they're jam packed full of knowledge and experience and, you know, and they're so willing to help with every, anything that you would um, ask them. So thank you guys. It was just a thank you. Oh, well, anytime. Wow, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was our pleasure to help. Yeah, we love doing it. I love talking about food stuff, especially since I'm like around a four-year-old all day. If I don't have to sing like cuckoo, or I like actually singing cuckoo king root, but if I don't have to sing wheels on the bus go round and round and I can actually have an adult conversation, I am right there. <laughs> so. I'm by myself all day, so I talk to cats. So I'm, I'm good at talking to people, so. Nice. Y'all can talk to me. No, do you guys have any questions? Remember, survey, extra credit. Turning in your assignment early on Sunday, extra credit. Isn't that great? You came to the live session, now you know about the extra credit. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Yeah, Chef, it's so great. Oh, so glad. So. I know I'm pretty excited about it. I, I love extra credit. So, I mean, it doesn't affect me any, but I do love extra credit. So, I don't know why y'all would not be like, what extra credit? Get you some extra credit. Get you some extra credit. Where's the survey at? Uh, the survey, I think, I believe it actually opens next week, but I'm preparing you now to know. Um, I believe it opens next Wednesday, but I'm preparing you now to remember you'll get extra credit if you do that survey. So, all right. Well, if you guys are all set, I hope you have a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous week. Enjoy your assignment and enjoy doing the discussion, pre-made versus non-pre-made, house-made. You guys get to decide. Isn't that fun? Yay! Then, I, think this, I think this week's assignment and this week's discussions are super fun. I, I I'm, I'm pumped for all they get to do this week. This is cool stuff. Yeah, it's better than my discussions for my, for my classes. I have to talk about corporate ethics in one of my discussions right now. I'd rather talk about pre-made versus in-house. I'd rather talk about pre-made french fries, so I'm good. They, they win. Yeah. You win. Although my aioli, I always make my own aioli.
I'm a purist when it comes to my aioli. And then my hollandaise, I saw people pulling out like one, one of my uh, people that I know, they were like, yeah, I make hollandaise. And it was like, you know, the powdered form. And I did that like, <gasps> you know, the gas. Cheaters. Yes, exactly. Because I'm even a purist when it comes to like, you know, like actually like doing my eggs and like if you're going to, uh, yeah, I'm very, well, eight years of doing better breakfast. I'm a purist for all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> but yeah, well, I hope everybody has a fabulous, fabulous rest of your week. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody's discussions and seeing the assignments turned in early because you're going for that extra credit. Am I right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. All right, guys. Have a great, great week. Good night, chefs. Thank you.